Hey there, and welcome to the Things I Used to Know Aviation series. In this series, we are going to solve a problem. And that problem is that I am currently standing on the ground. But what I would rather be doing is flying in the sky. Now, all of us have things that keep us from reaching our goals in life, whether that be family commitments, uh, monetary concerns, work commitments, and so on. But there comes a time for any goal when you realize that the only way you're going to make something happen is to just take that first step. So for me, I am taking the first step, and I want any of you who are interested to come right along with me. I have zero hours in a brand new flight log, and I'm going to chronicle my experiences and my thoughts and my method of study along the way to earning a private pilot certificate. Now, why would you want to follow along with someone who, per what I just admitted, does not yet know what he's doing? Well, what I think is cool here is that I don't know the end of this story yet. I know the beginning of the story. I know the goal, and I know, I think, what it's going to take to get from the beginning to the end. And I know that there are a lot of people out there who have this goal as well. And so what I thought I would do is make a record of my journey, both in case there's anyone else out there who is just starting on this path as well, who might benefit from anything that I have learned, uh, and also as a way to keep myself motivated and on the hook, because if I've put it out there that I'm working on this, it'll be a whole lot harder to let a setback keep me from continuing. This is an experiment. Human memory is a frail thing. We like to pretend that the bonds that tie us to our past are thicker than they really are. Our brains are masters at editing out our past mistakes, or at least softening our recollection of them. There are a number of podcasts out there by people who are already pilots. Their stories are valuable, even critical. But as with all stories told after the deeds they describe, they have the benefit of knowing how the story turns out. I do not. Here I want to create a space for a voice that doesn't yet know the end of the story. Because of that, some of what I say will turn out to be wrong. This is not a flight school. So if you're up for it, come along with me. So first things first, let's take a look at my approach to learning to fly. I'm based in the United States, so the flight regime here is set by the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA. The same four forces of lift, weight, thrust, and drag apply to pilots all around the world, but some other aspects of my experience are going to very much be bound to the way that the FAA does business. So the first thing to do is define what it even means to become a pilot in the United States. There are three routes to becoming a pilot in the U.S. There is the military route. Serve your country, and your country may train you to fly and pay your way to do it. There's a commercial route. It's possible to get a college degree in aviation or uh, otherwise make a career of it. Uh, stay at it long enough and you may get to fly the really, quote, big iron, 747 and jumbo jets. I've already got a career that I'm quite happy with, though, so that's not my route either. And then there is general aviation, abbreviated GA. GA in the United States is anything that isn't commercial or military. So generally, this means small planes and private pilots. This is our route. In the U.S., we call our pilot license a pilot certificate. So when you're getting started as a civilian, there are three kinds of certificates. There is Sport Pilot, which lets you fly in daylight with clear skies, only in light aircraft, and only with one passenger at most. There is Recreational Pilot, which is like sport, but you can fly more powerful aircraft. Uh, and then there is Private Pilot, which is probably the picture you have in your head when you think pilot's license. There are a few other important differences between those three types of certificates especially in terms of what they require in terms of medical certification to fly. Uh, the three types can build on each other as well. So you can pass through sport and or recreational on the way to private, but it doesn't have to work that way. But as long as you're careful to pick an instructor who's certified to instruct towards a private certificate, then any time you spend on a sport or recreational certificate will count towards private if you decide to go for that later. My goal is private pilot. I may and may not earn sport or recreational along the way that remains to be seen. So what does it take to learn to fly? There are four primary ways that people learn to fly. One, talked about earlier, you join the military. Do this if you want to fly for your country. 
Two, you can go to a professional flight school. Uh, if you're going to be a commercial pilot, if you're going to make a career out of being a pilot, then this is a route that a lot of people take. Uh, these are also called Part 141 schools after the section of the FAA rules that regulate them. Three is you find a local CFI, that's a certified flight instructor, and you take private lessons from him or her. And, and four, which is really just a more structured version of three, if you find a local GA flight program, which will just be a, a somewhat more structured version of taking private pilot lessons from a CFI. The key word to remember for category three and four there is local, because it takes time to learn to fly. It seems like I would fall into category three, take flight lessons from a CFI. So the steps here are roughly as follows. First, there's ground school. You may have classroom style lessons from your CFI, or you may do home study using books or a video series like the series from Sporties or King. Second, there is flight training. Going up in an airplane with a CFI and learning to physically fly the airplane. Now at some point during your training, you'll need to get a third class medical exam uh, and you can't get this from just any doctor. You have to see an aviation medical examiner for this. Now, this is changing. This is changing within the next year. Uh, we don't know exactly when. The law has just changed that will require many people to no longer need uh, a, a third class medical. Right now, I will still need one unless I wait a year uh, to get started. But if you're listening to this sometime in 2017 or after the rules may have changed by then, so you'll want to look and see what the current rules are. Fourth, there will come a time at some point during your flight training when your flight instructor believes that you are competent and ready to take the plane up and down on your own without him or her in the seat next to you. Uh, this is called the solo. After that comes more flight training. At some point along the way, you have to take the FAA knowledge test. Uh, which is a written test. It's actually a computerized test uh, that is multiple choice questions on general aviation knowledge. Finally, whenever your instructor believes you're ready, uh, you take what's called the check ride and the oral exam. And that is where a designated FAA examiner uh, quizzes you essentially for an hour and then goes up in the airplane with you and you show him that you know how to fly the airplane and know enough about flight to earn that certificate. And of course, then that is the last step you actually receive the certificate that allows you to fly an airplane. But of course, I say last step, that's only the last step of the first leg of a longer journey uh, because once you have a private pilot certificate, uh, you will, if you want to be a safe pilot, if you want to continue to actually fly and not stop right there, you'll continue to learn throughout your entire flying career. Often those ground school and flight school steps are done simultaneously. You fly some, study some, fly some, study some, over several months. You get your certificate when you can pass written, verbal, and practical tests, and you get to take those tests when your instructor feels that you're ready for them. Now, practical here means that you're actually flying the airplane. It's the practice of flying the airplane. Uh, however, no matter when you are, quote, ready, per what your instructor uh, believes, there are some minimum flight time requirements set by the FAA. So for a sport certificate, the minimum is 20 hours. For recreational, it's 30. And for private pilot, it's 40 hours. Uh, however, the statistics are that most people take more than the minimum number of hours before they're ready. Uh, the numbers you see on this will vary widely, very, very widely. <laughs> but I've seen estimates that the private certificate may actually be taking people closer to 70 or 80 hours on average these days. So the bottom line is you don't get flight lessons done in a weekend. So, I recently drove to four different GA airports that are within about an hour of my house in different directions, and I chatted up whoever I found at the front desk there. Uh, all four of them had local CFIs who teach lessons out of that airport. Uh, I got several business cards, and I know a few other possibilities just a little further away as well, so I know I've got options here. So, now how do I make this happen? And I don't mean the easy part, finding a CFI. Uh, like I said, I've got four airports that are close enough to me that I can do this, and all of them do flight training. But what I mean is the hard part, finding the time. That's the part that's hard for all of us. 
Some people have jump right in personalities. They find a CFI, they start flying first thing. At some point, they will start studying for the knowledge test. Uh, often a flight school or a CFI, they'll offer a coupon or a discount on a first flight. This is called a discovery flight. Uh, you just, they go and take you up uh, and you get to hold the stick for a couple minutes during the flight. And, uh, you know, just to find out whether or not you feel like it's something that you want to do. Other people start with the studying part first and then eventually may go on to actually start taking flight lessons. Uh, I'm sure both approaches have their pros and cons, but one thing that I know about myself is that I am a planner. I'm most comfortable when I've done everything I can to prepare ahead of time. So my first step here has got to be to make a plan. So to make the plan, let's first take stock of my assets. Uh, one, I find it a whole lot easier to study and concentrate for long periods of time now than when I was younger. Two, I probably have enough money for the lessons right now. Probably. Three, by posting this video, I've got myself on the hook now. So that's going to help me keep my motivation up to actually do it. Uh, however, there are some liabilities as well. One, the fall is coming. That means shuttling children to Boy Scout meetings, popcorn sales, soccer practice, dance class, you name it. And then two, uh, it just so happens that in my day job, the fall is the busiest time of year. Uh, and that can make for some really unpredictable hours. All of that's going to make it hard to schedule regular time with a local CFI. Uh, that's exactly the kind of situation, actually, that contributes to the extremely high dropout rate for flight training. Uh, as many as 80% of people who start learning to fly never get their certificate. There is an alternative, though. There are a few places that offer what is called accelerated training. Essentially, you drop out of life for a bit and you learn general aviation over a period of several weeks rather than several months. Now, this sounds like an adventure. Go live in another city for several weeks, immersed every day in aviation. And that leads me to a final asset, which is that I have a job where, at least for a little while, I could work nights and odd hours. However, even though it's only for a few weeks, at least for this first session that I have in mind, Spending that time away from home and away from my family is, is going to be tough. So if I do this, I have got to make the absolute most of it. Every second of time in the program has to count, and that means preparing ahead of time. So for me, it sounds like the study is going to come first. So here's the plan. I'm going to spend the next few months studying. I'll take an online ground school, maybe more than one, and then I'll go take the FAA knowledge test. I've actually heard from a number of sources that it's a good idea to go ahead and take the knowledge test early once you're competent to take it, but as early as you're competent to take it. Uh, and in my case, doing that would also give my instructor and I a good idea of my strengths and weaknesses as I go into an accelerated flight training. So the way I see it, I've got about four to six months to learn everything I possibly can on the ground. Let's get started.